For those of us who do get this, I think there are basically only about four kinds of response strategies that are thinkable. Top-down government policy, we've got to convince world leaders or national leaders that this is what's happening, that they need to change their policies in a profound way to conserve fossil fuels, to build alternative energy infrastructure, public transportation, et cetera, et cetera, at a wartime scale of effort. But I've been trying to do that, and a lot of people I know have been trying to do that for the past mm, seven, eight years, and it's really hard to get through because most politicians depend on economic growth to get reelected. So they really don't want to hear that kind of message. So that leaves bottom-up grassroots organizing as an alternative. You know, maybe there are things that only public officials can do in terms of changing policy, but, you know, if, if the public officials are not going to do that, we've got to do what we can at the local level. Building more uh, resilience in our lives, in our communities, so that relocalization of the food supply isn't happening by decree from on, on high, it's just happening from the groundswell from the bottom up. We need to proactively plan for a future without fossil fuels. That means saying, well, where do we want to be in 2050? Well, in terms of climate change, decreased carbon emissions by 80, 90 percent, or even, even more. That's what we want to do. So how do we get there? Well, we, we backcast a series of steps that will get us to there by 2050. That's, that's good planning for linear adaptation. But what if it's actually already too late in some ways. What if we've already put so much carbon into the atmosphere that we're going to see climate chaos anyway? Even if we were to stop dead in our tracks and not put any more carbon in the atmosphere, it's likely that we've already put so much CO2 up there that we will still see melting ice caps, rising sea levels, desertification, etc., etc., etc. So, in addition to long-range proactive planning, we also need to be doing some responsive planning for crisis management. We have to anticipate that there will be economic, environmental, and other kinds of crises over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We, we have to accept that as a given and begin to plan for them at every level of society. I've used the word resilience already. I'm going to suggest to you that this may be the most important word of the 21st century because what it refers to is the ability to absorb shocks and continue to function. Shocks are on the way. We're already seeing them and they're going to get worse. And if we're going to absorb those shocks, we have to build more resilient communities. Right now, our economic system, our transport system, our food system are not resilient. They're brittle. Resilience typically means redundancy in critical systems. Now, what we've done over the past few decades is try to squeeze redundancy out of the system everywhere we could. And that's, that's called economic efficiency. If you can grow corn cheaper in Iowa than anywhere else, then all corn should be grown in Iowa, and we should grow nothing in Iowa other than corn. Right? That's economic efficiency. Or manufacturing in China, or take your pick. That's economically efficient, but it's not resilient. It's it a, makes for a brittle system because if the corn crop fails in Iowa, that means no corn anywhere. A resilient system is one that tolerates redundancy, even if it leads to some economic inefficiency. Dispersed system control points, that means localization of production, consumption, and, and decision making. Dispersed inventories. Remember I talked about the three-day supply on, on the shelves of a typical supermarket? That's a, that's a disaster waiting to happen. What if everyone has a food pantry? What if everyone is growing food in their backyard with neighbors in vacant lots and in neighborhoods, and every neighborhood has a food processing and food storage center, so that there are distributed in inventories all throughout society, a vastly more resilient system, and also balancing feedback loops, giving the, the market, for example, which is, the market is characterized by balancing feedback loops, but it lacks the information to tell it that global renewable and non-renewable resources are about to become more scarce and need to be conserved. I first became aware of this actually before, even before it happened when I met uh, a brilliant young permaculture teacher uh, named Rob Hopkins in Ireland back in 2005. Uh, <coughs> he 
realized what a, what a challenge peak oil would be, and he said, well, what if we could design a transition process away from fossil fuels that actually was fun, that looked to life after fossil fuels as actually being better than life with fossil fuels. These transition initiatives in towns have sprung up like wildfire all over the planet. There are over 250 of them now, uh, over 60 in the US alone. Uh, and now that I understand, not only are there many transition towns in, in Canada, and you'll hear more about that after I speak, but also there's a national hub supporting the emergence of transition initiatives uh, called Transition Canada. So this is something anybody can get involved with. It's, it's free and it's fun. It's more like a party than a protest march. And it calls on us to redefine what growth is. You know, as long as we define economic growth in terms of GDP, of increased per capita consumption of resources, we are stuck in a trap because we can't grow the economy that way anymore. And so we, we, will, we are destined for frustration and disappointment. However, who says that is the be-all and end-all of human existence, that growth should be defined by GDP and increasing per capita consumption rates? What if we defined growth in terms of human well-being and happiness? What if we defined growth not in terms of uh, how many new prisons we can build, because if you build more prisons, that increases the GDP. But how, how about if we define growth by how few people are in prison because they're otherwise employed in society and having a good time and don't need to go out and, and steal from people or whatever. What if instead of the GDP increasing as we spend more on armaments and use those armaments overseas, what if we measure growth in terms of our sense of security as a people, as a nation, so we don't need to spend as much or maybe even anything on armaments? That would increase our quality of life, right? It would, might lower the GDP, but that's okay, because we know it's gonna be lowering anyway. We can reallocate what GDP, energy consumption, resource consumption is still possible. We can reallocate that to support what actually brings people health and well-being. If you live in a country where you can't afford to cook your food or keep your home warm at night and it's cold outside, you're not happy. Surprise. But once those basic human needs are met, from there on, up the curve, there is no correlation whatsoever between levels of consumption and self-reported levels of satisfaction with life. In fact, there are a number of countries with fairly low consumption levels where people report themselves as being considerably happier than people in the US or Canada. I believe, you don't have to take my word for it, Crunch the numbers yourself, look at the data, think about it, read some books, but consider the possibility that we, we may be, in fact, at the limits to growth or peak everything right now. Consider the possibility of focusing not just on solutions, which regard the, the, the global situation as a problem to be solved. There aren't solutions to many of these situations I've been talking to you about. I mean, if, if you regard the solution to peak oil as finding an alternative energy source that will enable us to continue driving and buying cars the way we've been doing, and in fact, even more so, so that, you know, 500 million Chinese have, have automobiles and, uh, by 10 years from now, that's not going to happen. We can do something about all of the situations that I've described for you this evening. And I still believe that life can actually be better if we do so. It's an old saying that crisis, every crisis is an opportunity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to suggest to you that we are experiencing and about to experience the biggest opportunity of our lifetimes. I hope we seize it. Thank you very much.